Welcome everybody to our town hall meeting and thank you to Heather Gibbons, our ASL interpreter for supporting today's event. Today I'm joined by Instructional Services Bilingual School Coach Elizabeth Ermanita to share updates on supports for English learner students and Executive Director Trish Campbell, Director Tara Patrick and Student Support Supervisor Mike Bielsma to share updates from our special education department. I'm excited to have these guests join me today to give more insight into the critical supports their teams are providing during remote learning. These teams are essential to ensuring all students at Seattle Public Schools thrive with a focus on students furthest from educational justice. As part of our strategic plan, Seattle Excellence, our EL staff have translated key information and resources for our families and students. Since building closures, our translation team supported over 800 meetings with families, including IEPs, parent conferences, and the translation of over 2,300 documents. And our special education department has been supporting students and families' individual needs per each student's IEP. Before I pass it over to them, I do want to share an important update. Earlier today, I let families and staff know that I am not seeking a new contract with Seattle Public Schools. My current contract is planned to finish at the end of June 2021. It has been the greatest honor of my professional journey to serve Seattle Public Schools students, families, school leaders, educators, and staff for the past two and a half years. And I continue to be inspired every day by the many talented, hardworking educators and staff dedicated to the success of Seattle's children, and I'm privileged to work alongside them. One of the many reasons I chose to take this position a few years ago was because of the district's deep commitment to racial justice. As Seattle Public Schools first native superintendent, advancing racial equity and social justice has been deeply personal to me, and I'm really proud of the ways that we have moved the needle for students. Now I'm ready to take my next steps and I know that I'm leaving this organization in the capable hands of just high performing, really quality staff. But we're really here today to give key updates on our COVID-19 response and hear from EL and special education staff on student supports. As an educator, I know that there is no replacement for in-person instruction and that our youngest learners and some students in special education service pathways especially are struggling. This weekend, staff and I attended a Seattle School Board retreat where we presented recommendations for increasing in-person learning. We recommend expanding in-person instruction for about 2,000 of our students receiving special education services and students in pre-K through first grade as early as March 2021. Seattle Public Schools remains committed to balancing the health and safety of our community in response to public health recommendations and the very real academic and social emotional needs of our students. Staff have been working tirelessly since last March to already, uh, they're already preparing for a potential re return to school buildings. Um, staff have reviewed HVAC systems in our buildings. They've analyzed capacity and staffing they have created safety and PPE processes. Um, we've also created plans to support families who don't want to return and high risk staff that are unable to return in person. And while we believe this is the best way forward, this decision would need approval from the Seattle School Board and agreement from our labor partners. Any changes to our current model will require bargaining new working conditions with SEA and we will continue to follow the guidance of public health experts. This process continues to be dynamic and it fluctuates as we receive new information, but we will keep you informed throughout this entire process. In the meantime, the most important thing any of us can do is mask up, stay home and support each other. I'm going to now pass it over to Elizabeth Ermanita to share updates on our EL supports. Thanks for being here.
right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Superintendent Juno, and it is my privilege to share with you some information about ELL or English Language Learner Services in Seattle Public Schools. I will start with the question, how does the ELL program support instruction for English learners? The ELL program upholds Seattle Excellence, our district's current strategic plan. The focus of instructional supports is to remove barriers to learning for English learners, thus improving academic and life outcomes for these students. We work with teachers to ensure that ELs have access to core instruction and that teaching and learning happens throughout the day. We also work hard in making sure that our SPS community value the contributions and leverage the assets ELs and their multilingual families bring. So who are these EL students? Who are the English learners? ELs come to our schools with a range of experiences and language proficiencies and variations in literacy. We have two distinct groups, our current ELLs and our former ELLs. Current ELs are students who qualified through the state's language proficiency screener, ELPA 21, and have not yet tested out. This includes current uh, students who barely speak English, and then students who, who are very fluent in spoken English and need some support in reading and writing. Additionally, we have the provisional ELs. These are students who speak a language other than English at home, and their families have agreed for them to be included in the ELL program without taking the ELPA 21 screener. This is because our state is not requiring districts right now to administer this assessment. Now, the other group is our former ELs. These students no longer qualify for ELL services based on ELPA 21. And we are proud to announce that in many cases, these students excel in state and district assessments. For example, 72% of former ELs are on standard or higher based on the third grade ELA ESBA, the English Language Arts State Assessment. In ninth grade, 89% of former ELs are on track to graduate, compared with 86% for district overall. And finally, based on our 2018 data, graduation rate is higher for former ELs at 90.7% compared to 817 for our district overall. So what supports do ELs receive and who teaches them? Let me say that ELs are general education students first. All our classroom teachers are expected to provide instruction with appropriate scaffolding so that English learners can engage with grade level content and with their peers. Teaching must include multiple opportunities for students to practice oral language, as well as reading and writing. Our ELD teachers or ELL teachers and bilingual IAs, instructional assistants, they work closely with classroom teachers in many different ways. Some of them include, um, they teach during whole class instruction, they teach in small groups, or they plan alongside classroom teachers so that instruction is accessible for our English learners. For example, an ELD teacher may prepare the class PowerPoint with pictures for the vocabulary lesson that the classroom teacher uses for the whole class. The ELD teacher may not actually be in the class. Now, during remote learning, our EL supports are not significantly different from EL supports during brick and mortar classrooms. During whole class online instruction, you should expect to see students with their cameras on and participating. For example, in a kindergarten class, I have observed students were acting out a scene from a story the teacher was reading aloud. Teacher may show pictures to help students understand what she is teaching, just like in the vocabulary PowerPoint I talked about earlier. The teacher will include pictures and graphic representations to increase understanding for all students. You'll also hear some specific activities while your students are online. You can hear students taking turns talking to share ideas. Teachers might provide sentence starters 
or sentence frames so students can communicate di their ideas clearly. They may vary the questions they ask students based on what students can do with the English language they currently have. You might also notice your students singing or reciting repetitive phrases with their classmates while online. When needed, your student may be in a small group, either with a classroom teacher, with an ELD teacher, with a bilingual IA, or with another staff at the school. Different students need different supports at different times, so groupings are very flexible. The goal in small grouping students may be to create smaller groups that allow more students participation. At other times, it is used to teach specific skills, for example, in reading or in math. Students may also receive one-on-one -on -one support during asynchronous learning, which um, Carrie has covered in the last town hall. So during asynchronous learning, the teacher may join the student to help in understanding the homework or individual assignments. Our teachers currently are continuously trying different ways to work together to support all the learners. Our ELL program is committed to making sure that English learners are receiving the instruction they need according to their strengths. We asked our multilingual families watching right now to help us elevate the value of our students' home languages and cultures by telling stories, conversing, reading, or singing with your children in the language that is most comfortable for you and your family at home. So this concludes our short update on ELL supports at this time. Thank you for being with us, and I pass this on to my special ed colleagues. Hi there. Um, thank you so much. That was so informative and, inform and um, so interesting. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, this is Trish Campbell. Um, I am the Executive Director of Special Education in Seattle Public Schools. Thank you for being here today. Um, we would really like to recognize that during this time of COVID and remote learning, that good communication and partnership with each other is more important than ever. I'd also like to share that the students and families of Seattle Public Schools are our number one priority and we care deeply for every student in every classroom. So um, today I'd like to introduce to you a few of our special education administrators. We have Director Mitchell and Supervisor Mike Bilesma. They'll share with you a couple of highlights and a couple of upcoming events. Hello, I'm Tara Mitchell, Director of Special Education, and I'd like to share some thoughts with you today about our programming. So during this time, that we're all experiencing, we're all keenly aware of what has changed and that it's now different. How we navigate common spaces, connect with family and friends, and most importantly here, doing school. We would like to take this time to reaffirm that even in this time of change, the focus of Seattle Public Schools and the Seattle Spe uh, Public Schools Special Education Department remains consistent. As a district, we continue to be focused on high quality instruction for all of our students. As a special education department, we are committed to supporting students and families in service of individual needs per students' IEPs. Building teams are providing specially designed instruction and supporting students as they access general education virtual classrooms. As a district department, we continue to provide leadership support for our building leaders and instructional teams. Your student continues to be our number one priority. We recognize that these are different times and want to assure you that our commitment to student growth is at the center of every decision made at the IEP meeting, at the school level, and at the central office. Most importantly, what has not changed is that your students, educators, and building leaders continue to be the best source of support and guidance for students and families during this time. If you have concerns or questions about your students' education, 
please do not hesitate to reach out to your student's case manager or special education teacher or the building principal. I would like to introduce at this time Mike Bilesma, our special education supervisor. Hello, I'm Mike Bilesma, one of the special education supervisors. I support many uh, special education services in many of our secondary schools. As Director Mitchell shared, we are committed to providing high quality special education services for all of our students. One of the ways to connect with our families and ensure good partnership is in our ongoing family engagement sessions. With community partners, we hosted six community forums. We heard directly from families about the challenges of remote learning families shared their needs and concerns, and we heard some celebrations as well. The second round of community forums is underway. As with the first round of community forums, each session will be co-hosted by members of the community. These forums are specifically designed to center the voices of our families furthest from educational justi justice, and will also provide plenty of opportunity for all families to share. The purpose of the second round of community forums is to address concerns raised in August, share updates on the work of the department, and answer some questions in real time. Our next community forum designed for our Spanish speaking families is this Friday evening at 6.30 p.m. We have several more sessions scheduled for January, and you can find details about how to join the session on the Special Education Department website calendar. No registration is required. I think we're ready for questions now, Superintendent Juno. All right, great. Thank you all. That was really great information. I just appreciate all the uh, deep quality work that's happening in both these departments for our students and families. There's just a lot going on, and particularly now that we're in remote, um, you know, I know it adds extra pressure. And and so just thank you um, for everything you're doing. Um, I guess a question for both is I know that there's some interest in sort of what's the setup look like, particularly in remote settings. So how can you explain a little bit about how instructional assistants are supporting instruction um, at this moment? Yes, so in the ELL program, our instructional assistants work closely with the classroom teachers and with the ELD teachers in each of the building. So they get um, sometimes small groups that they work with, uh, either in reading or in math, and they get close monitoring from the classroom teachers, um, other specialists in the building to do this work. At other times, they are supporting in asynchronous learning where they check in with students while the students are working individually um, doing homework or doing their individually assigned task. So there's different ways our IAs are supporting our students during this remote learning. And I would, this is um, Trish answering. Um, yes, that is very much the same that our, um, our special education um, paraprofessionals or instructional assistants who do amazing work for kids, build great relationships with their students and um, provide really consistent um, educational experiences for our students. Um, sometimes our um, instructional assistants are um, supporting students based on the student's individual needs and sometimes our, um, our instructional assistants are supporting students based on programmatic needs. So our um, assistants currently are supporting in small groups individually they're also serving um, in the general education um, classroom. They are doing some reteaching and um, at times pre-teaching um, and they are doing amazing work. We hear from families all the time how powerful a strong paraprofessional is in the classroom for their student. Yeah, I agree. That's very valuable services that get provided. So shout out to all the instructional assistants across the district. For special education staff, um, how are you determining which students are receiving in-person instruction at this time? Thank you, this is Tara. So IEPs 
our uh, decisions, uh, IP meetings, sorry, are where we're making those decisions regarding remote and in-person instruction and where that learning is going to take place. So IP guidance training was delivered to school leaders and to staff. If a student is not making a meaningful growth on their IEP goals, IEP teams can come together to determine if additional supports or trainings are going to be needed. IEP meetings are conducted, including the full team, the families, the students, if it's appropriate, school staff, and all of these people are present to ensure that um, an IEP and the learning plans are in place to support the student. If a student is not making meaningful growth, it could be determined by the team that it's appropriate for the student to receive in-person services to support specific goals. If that decision is made after a review of the data, the IEP team coordinates with the district level special education department and an interdepartmental inter team across district office. And uh, we utilize a decision making protocol in alignment with OSPI guidance and uh, Department of Health and Labor and Industry to support uh, staffing and instructional supports to bring the students in. Great, and so I, I, I guess back to Elizabeth, um, for parents who don't speak English, how can they get support if a teacher asks you know, to meet with them? And so how does that work? They can always request from their school. Um, right now we have um, the talking points, which is a first step in the communication. So they can send message to their uh, classroom teacher, to their student's classroom teacher, send them a message in their own language, and the teacher, of course, gets it in English, requesting for um, interpretation for an upcoming meeting. And the teacher can reach out to their EL, EL team in the school or request uh, support from our, our district office uh, in terms of who might be able to provide um, interpretation. Additionally, we have the phone interpretation also, which teachers can tap into once they have set up the meeting with the parents. Um, interpretation is always available and it is a right for all our families who speak a language other than English. So we make sure we provide them in different possible ways we can. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, my child's IEP team made the decision for him to receive in-person services. Uh, and what's sort of like, what's the process from that and the length of time and expectations around that? This is Tara again. So the process is that once that educational decision has been made, we then have to do uh, an analysis of what level of PPE is going to be needed in order to mitigate risk for the student and for the adults. And as you may be aware, there's been varying guidance as time has gone on regarding uh, uh, supports that it should be put in place by Department of Health and LNI and our health services team has been tirelessly working to make sure that what protocols we put in place are in alignment with that and again to keep adults and students uh, at the lowest risk as possible and so once that clearance has been done and it's been determined then we meet with the school staff and determine the staffing and delivery of service model and then health and safety provides a training for all staff that will be working with the student and then once that PPE training is done and Families been notified about our health and safety protocols, then we're able to start uh, select a start date for those students. Transportation has been uh, just wonderful being able to transport students individually with our part using our uh, partners facilities has been in play nutrition services. And so it's a really an interdepartmental team working together to uh, ramp up to provide in person services for our students. That's great. Um, I know there's just a lot of moving pieces while we're in this remote era and it's not easy. I mean, there are no easy decisions right now and, and you know, there are, it's, uh, 
it's tough. And I know that it's, you know, people are getting wary and all that. And just from your professional experiences, um, like what, just let me know and tell people like, what's your best advice for families right now? And, you know, for, for particularly students and families who are receiving both EL services and special education services, like what, what would be your best piece of advice for them? I would say that the first um, the first thing I would say is that you're you're probably doing a really good job right now. You're at home with your student all day and you've become a teacher that may, most likely you weren't intending to be a teacher. I dreamed of being a teacher all my life. I knew it right away. My guess is most of you out there are teaching right now and you didn't know that you were wanting to be um, that person that was going to be educating your child from home. So first I would say our families and parents need to know that they're doing the very best that they can with what they have and we appreciate their partnership with that. I would say if you are a family that's um, that's finding struggle or your students finding struggle to really reach out to your um, student special education teacher or case manager um, and or their general education teacher and ask for some supports. It is OK to ask for supports and it's also OK to change things up, do things a little bit differently. Um, if your child struggles at a certain time of day, maybe you need to adjust that if they're doing really well at a certain time of the day. So th those are some things to, to get started with, just to think through that um, you can ask for support, it's there, and that um, your child's case manager, special education teacher would like nothing more than to help um, you and your child work together in partnership. And then to reach out for, to the building leader, if, that, if, you're, if things are still not working right, reach out. So, um, but I do want to really say thank you to all the families out there, caregivers, guardians, parents that are all stepping up and supporting their student and supporting their educators as they're doing the very best they can to um, to um, help students make progress. Um, For our EL families, um, our goal is really to to make sure we elevate diverse cultures and diverse languages and what an opportunity right now for the families who who are uh, with their children most of the day to really talk in the language that is most comfortable for them tell stories sing in the language um really enrich the family life because there's an opportunity there right now we know that literacy in any language transfers to acquiring a new language. So the stronger they are in all the things about their families, in, in the storytelling, in the singing, in the conversing, in the knowing about their own histories, the stronger they will be academically and like they'll be lifelong learners. They will take charge. So relax and tell stories in the language that's most comfortable for you and your family. That's great. Thank you all so much. Um, just really appreciate uh, everything you're doing and uh, know that uh, our system really appreciates your service. But just want to thank everybody for joining us today. We'll be back again next week with a special edition of our town hall, ha, town hall uh, focused on mental health supports. So I hope that you will join us then. And thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.